Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Provost Aubrey, uh, Provost and uh, Senior Vice President at Tufts University. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the 36th Norris and Marjorie Benenson EPIC International Symposium on China and the world. First, let me express my deep appreciation to the Benenson family. You are wonderful friends of Tufts and of the Institute for Global Leadership, IGL. I'm also extremely grateful to Abby Williams, director of IGL, as well as to the IGL board. Your active engagement and support of IGL help enable Tufts to be a global leader. Thank you also to all the speakers participating in this symposium, especially today's Dr. Jean Mayer, Global Citizenship keynote speaker, Ambassador Harry Harris. IGR provides students with robust academic and experiential opportunities a unique approach to education that empowers our students to apply theory to practice in addressing some of the world's most pressing issues. IGL's excellence in teaching, research, mentoring, and internship placements prepare students across the university to be true, true global citizens who create positive change in our global society. This is of utmost importance for each and every one of us. Congratulations to the EPIC students for your hard work and dedication in organizing this symposium. EPIC is a transformational experience as many alumni attest. The knowledge and skills that you have gained will be of lifelong benefit to all of you. Finally, I would like to thank the IGL staff for your commitment to Tufts and for the work you do to accomplish IGL's important mission. Over the next few days, I hope you all enjoy the keynote address and the panels, but also exchange ideas through the breakout sessions. Again, a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us and all the best for a wonderful, wonderful symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Provost Aubrey, for those remarks and for your support of IGL. I am Abby Williams, Director of the Institute for Global Leadership and Professor of the Practice of International Politics at the Fletcher School. I am delighted that so many of you have joined us for the 36th Annual EPIC International Symposium on China and the World. IGL's mission is to develop new generations of effective and ethical global leaders who are able to comprehend complexity, reflect political and cultural nuance, and engage as responsible global citizens in confronting global problems. The Institute integrates intellectual rigor and experiential education, connects theory and practice, ideas and action. IGL's mission is encapsulated in its motto, thinking beyond boundaries, acting across borders. Our programs offer unique opportunities for tough students and faculty to make a difference in the world. I, EPIC is IGL's foundational program and challenges students to think critically about questions of pivotal importance to the world. Since September, the students in the EPIC colloquium have been engaged in rigorous reading and discussion among themselves and with more than 20 guest lecturers to learn about China and the world. The rise of China is one of the most significant developments in global affairs 
And it is critical for our students to understand the country's growing influence and impact on the world. This symposium with panels and small group discussions happening over three days is a product of EPIC's student-centered learning. The students have also uh, demonstrated remarkable creativity and ad adaptability in organizing a virtual symposium. We are pleased that over 60 students from Brazil, Canada, China, Greece, Ireland, Kenya, Russia, and Singapore are participating in the symposium as part of TILIP, IGL's leadership and international perspective program. A warm welcome and thanks to our keynote speaker, Ambassador Harry Harris. And as the provost has said, a warm welcome to all our panelists who are participating in this symposium. I am pleased that today we will honor Ambassador Harris with the Dr. Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award in recognition of his distinguished service. I would also like to express our profound gratitude to the Bendenson family, especially Bobby and Joanne Bendenson, their generous and steadfast friends of IGL. Sincere thanks also to the IGL's external advisory board, the members uh, actively support us and we're grateful uh, for their engagement. And of course, last but not least, Thanks to the dynamic IGL team, Heather Barry, Saida Abdallah, Stacey Kasakova, and Keisha Kanyada for your commitment, for your dedication, and for being such wonderful colleagues. We look forward to our discussions today and the following two days. We hope that participants in the symposium will gain fresh and essential insights into the complex global role of China. So now I will ask Gwen Mexas, a member of the 2021 EPIC class to introduce Ambassador Harris. Over to you, Gwen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Gwen Mexas, and I'm a senior in EPIC studying international relations. Thank you for joining us today as we start the 36th EPIC Symposium on China in the world. This weekend feels particularly timely for this topic as today marks the first high-level meeting of the Biden administration with their Chinese counterparts. Since September, our class has been diligently working together, some of us socially distanced in person and others on Zoom to organize this symposium. And we are thrilled to finally be getting it underway today. We also want to extend our gratitude to Professor Williams, Heather Berry, and all of the staff at the IGL. Without their support, in work, we would not be here today. On behalf of the EPIC class of 2021, it is my honor to introduce Ambassador Harry Harris as our keynote speaker. Most recently serving as the 23rd United States Ambassador to South Korea, Ambassador Harris is an American diplomat and highly decorated Navy officer. Prior to his tenure as ambassador, Admiral Harris was the commander of the United States Pacific Command the 24th commander since it was established in 1947. As the first American of Japanese descent in this position and the highest ranking American of Japanese descent in the United States Navy at the time, he advocated for the pe peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Ambassador Harris's career in public service began in 1979 when he was designated as Naval Flight Officer he has served in every geographic combatant command region and participated in the following major operations. Operation Achille Lorero, terrorist hijacking incident, Attain Document 3, Earnest Will, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, Willing Spirit, and Odyssey Dawn. Admiral Harris's staff assignments have included three tours on the staff of Chief of Naval Operations and is Chief Speechwriter to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He has also served as Assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a position in which he was the direct representative of the Chairman to the United States Secretary of State 
in the US Roadmap Monitor for the Middle East peace process. As a four-star admiral, having logged over 4,400 flight hours, including over 400 combat hours, he has received numerous awards and accolades for his lifetime of service, including multiple for his work in diversity and leadership. A graduate of the United States Naval Academy, Admiral Harris was the Navy's old GOAT, the longest serving Naval Academy graduate still on active duty, and the Navy's 15th Gray Owl the Naval Flight Officer on active duty who had held this designation for the longest period. As such, today I have the honor of presenting Ambassador Harris with the Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award. This award was established in 1993 to honor Jean Mayer, the 10th President and Chancellor of Tufts University by bringing to campus distinguished scholars and practitioners whose moral courage personal integrity and passion for scholarship resonated Dr. Meyer's dictum that scholarship, research, and teaching must be dedicated to solving the most pressing problems facing the world. And without further ado, it is my honor to present Ambassador Harris with this Global Citizenship Award, which he is holding now. And thank you, Ambassador Harris. I'll now turn the program over to you for your keynote address. Okay, uh, thanks, Gwen, for that great introduction. Uh, and thanks, uh, Provost uh, Aubrey and uh, Dr. Williams for your remarks as well. You all set a high bar for me today. And a shout out to Ambassador uh, John Hennessy Nyland, who's in the audience, uh, who was in Fletcher's uh, first EPIC class uh, back in 1986. And I think Dr. Williams was a TA for that class, so how cool is that? So ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm humbled to receive an award which honors uh, Dr. Jean Mayer and all that he did for Tufts uh, as your fourth president, all he did for France and the Allies as a soldier with the Free French in World War II, and all he did for global health uh, as a biomedical research leader. I'm honored as well to participate in this important event hosted by this amazing university and graduate school known globally for excellence in producing practitioners and scholars who work at the often dangerous intersection of law and diplomacy. This symposium, which examines the PRC's role in the world today is especially timely. At this, the advent of the Biden administrations and the importance of the president and his team places on the Indo-Pacific region. So good morning. Uh, in public speaking, we're taught never to lead with an apology, but I'm going to do so anyway. I'm sorry for not having a lot of eye candy behind me. Uh, you know, a bookcase is full of memorabilia and the like. Uh, my wife and I arrived at our new home here in Colorado just over a month ago, and I'm barely able to make myself look presentable, let alone my home office. But this particular piece of eye candy uh, is definitely cool. So thank you all again. Now, I can't think of a better way to begin the new year and my post-government life than to share with you my thoughts on the alliance between the United States and the Republic of Korea, or ROK. But before I get started, I'd like to say a few words on the deplorable events of January 6th in Washington. The violent actions of the mob that attacked the US Capitol, an attack on US democracy itself, serve as a sharpest reminder of America's challenges, but also America's ultimate strength, resilience, and commitment to democracy. I take hope from Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem that our nation, quote, isn't broken, but simply unfinished, unquote. President Joe Biden is now the 46th commander in chief of the United States. I emphasize to my interlocutors in Seoul before I left that the noble work of the Alliance will continue. And I express my confidence that President Biden and his team will continue to work with leaders there to strengthen the relationship in all its dimensions, not just the security one. There's a new sheriff in town. Paraphrasing Goethe, divide and rule is one approach to governance, unite and lead is another. It's a powerful statement that the first overseas trip by this administration is to the Indo-Pacific region. Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin are wrapping up their joint trip to Japan and the ROK. When I wore the uniform of the US Navy, 
I used to say the three great ships ply the seven seas, leadership, stewardship, and partnership. It's the noble mission of this university to teach leadership and imbue stewardship in its students and community. So I won't dwell on those ships. I'll spend some time on a third one, partnership, which is really a subset of a larger vessel, and that's relationship. Relationships come in many forms, and I'll speak a little about the people-to-people -people version, then I'll spend a little longer on the nation-to-nation -nation variety. I would not have become a flag officer in our Navy, let alone a four-star admiral, without the relationship I had with your former Dean, Admiral Jim Stavridis. He mentored me across my career, taught me to love books and learning, emphasized and exemplified principal leadership, and rescued me professionally when I was adrift and in danger of running aground. This is what leaders do. Fletcher was indeed fortunate to have had Jim Stavridis at your helm for five years. So to you students out there, learn from your teachers, pay attention and pay it forward. Now, as I've said on countless occasions in uniform and in Mufti, internationally, relationships matter and alliances matter. They are the most integral element of US foreign policy. I hope you've had the chance to read the administration's brand new interim national security guidance. It recognizes that alliances are not luxuries. They are essentials. President Biden has called alliances our greatest asset. This week's op-ed in the Washington Post by Secretaries Blinken and Austin make clear that alliances are vital to our national security. They deliver for the American people. In my opinion, this guidance underscores that when working with allies, give and take is preferred to slash and burn. Case in point, the almost 71 year US ROK alliance was forged during a devastating conflict. It has stood the test of time. It's mind boggling to consider how much has changed in the world in general, Northeast Asia in particular, and the Korean Peninsula especially since 1950. Some changes have been for the better such as the ROK's miraculous growth into an economic and cultural powerhouse, a high-tech innovation nation, which is leading by example in the battle against COVID-19. South Korea faced a third wave of COVID-19 outbreaks at the end of 2020, centered in the capital and surrounding areas. Korea went on virtual lockdown when they had a thousand cases a day across a country of 52 million people. We have plateaued at what, 60,000 cases a day? As of today, Korea experienced a little more than 97,000 total cases and a little less than 1,700 deaths since the pandemic began over a year ago. Contrast those numbers with ours. Korea's approach on COVID-19 has been lauded and rightly so as a global model. It's not that complicated. Follow the rules and follow the science. I think Dr. Mayer would say the same. Other changes on the peninsula have been for the worst, such as North Korea's unrelenting pursuit of nuclear weapons. While the DPRK may no longer be the ROK's official enemy, it's helpful to recall that during the January 8th Workers' Party Congress, Kim Jong-un talked about strengthening North Korea's nuclear deterrent and military capabilities. Early this month, the IAEA expressed real concerns about the trajectory of North Korea's nuclear program. And just two days ago, Pyongyang yet again threatened the United States. But throughout the years, the US ROK alliance has remained and continues to be the bulwark against North Korean aggression and the linchpin upon which regional security and stability stand. There's a satellite photo out there of a nighttime view of the Korean Peninsula. This photo and the stark contrast between the beaming South and the pitch black North represents choices and their outcomes what 67 years of our strategic alliance has brought to the people of the Republic of Korea. As the ROK has changed and developed over the years, so too has the US ROK Alliance. This alliance is dynamic, a multi-dimensional partnership reinforced by shared values, shared concerns, and shared economic interests and underpinned by the deepest of people-to-people -people ties. It has lasted generations and will continue to thrive for generations to come as long as we together nurture it, reinforce it, and remain committed to it. There are now over 2 million Americans of Korean descent, including four members of Congress, senior officials in our military, 
U.S. diplomatic state and federal government officials, entertainers, and wildly successful business leaders. American music and movies have long been popular in the ROK, but now Korea is a cultural force in the USA and around the world. These strong and growing people-to-people -people ties not only constitute the essential fabric of our dynamic bilateral relationship, but they also provide resilience for us to overcome any and all challenges together. Naturally, there are disagreements within the US ROK alliance, which is to be expected in any co-equal partnership spanning seven decades. The US and ROK continue to work at the highest levels on issues such as fair trade, defense cost sharing, and the future command structure of American and Korean forces on the peninsula as envisioned by the transition of wartime operational control or OPCON. I'm pleased that our country has reached an agreement on cost sharing. It was a slog getting to this point, but there's much to celebrate. My hat's off to the negotiating team from both countries, to my former colleagues at state and the embassy in Seoul and the US forces Korea. The US is fully committed to the alliance and it stands firmly with the ROK. So I believe the outlook for the US ROK alliance is excellent. This is important because as you all are well aware, North Korea and the PRC will continuously test the resolve of this relationship and will seek ways to weaken our strong ties and sow doubt in order to divide us. Now, while we hope for diplomacy uh, with North Korea to be successful, we must recognize that hope alone is not a course of action. The US ROK joint military training is designed to support peace on the peninsula and in the region while ensuring that we maintain readiness and never let our guard down. The quest for dialogue with the North must not be made at the expense of the ability to respond to threats from the South. Dialogue and military readiness must go hand in hand. Idealism must be rooted in realism. There are ample historic examples of what could transpire, including what happened on that fateful day almost 71 years ago, if we're not ready. Just read T.R. Fairbanks, This Kind of War, if you remain skeptical. It's unfortunate that North Korea has not yet embraced the opportunity presented by three US and three ROK presidential summits. And if you believe the media of late, the recent overtures by the Biden administration to Pyongyang. The U.S. continues to seek transformed relations between Washington and Pyongyang, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula and the complete denuclearization of North Korea, all of which were agreed upon in Singapore in 2018 and was set the conditions for a brighter future for the North Korean people. Now, while I believe that Singapore was far from a perfect agreement, it brought us to a place we've never been before. I hope Chairman and now General Secretary Kim Jong-un seizes the opportunity. And now a word about the People's Republic of China. After all, this is the raison d'etre of this conference. I'm often asked about whether the ROK is being forced to choose between its only security ally and its number one trading partner. This is a false narrative designed to sow doubt about the history and strength of our alliance. Now, the United States has partnered well with China on several important fronts. But the United States and Beijing fundamentally disagree on how to approach the current international order. The Chinese government doesn't keep its word from its treaty with the British on Hong Kong to its human rights abuses against the Uyghurs, Tibetans and others to its attempts at commercial espionage and its quest to isolate and then dominate Taiwan. As former Assistant Secretary of State Dave Stilwell recently said, the Leninist Politburo that runs China wants to set the rules for the whole world, which is why it's essential for free nations to exercise vigilance. This is why the United States has made it very clear through its Indo-Pacific strategy that the US rejects foreign policies based on leverage and dominance and seeks instead to strengthen relationships based on respect, equal footing and fair exchange. We believe in partnership economics. We won't weaponize debt. Instead, we strive to build environments that foster good, productive market economies. We encourage every country to work in its own interests to protect its own sovereignty. As a former Secretary of State said, China's bullying in the South China Sea reflects a broader choice for nations in the region, coercion and control of freedom and the rule of law. Now, 
while the how-to regarding dealing with Beijing will certainly change with the Biden administration. I note that the fundamental understanding of the PRC has not. Consider that Secretary of State Blinken testified at his confirmation hearing that the previous administration's tougher approach is right, that what is happening in Xinjiang is genocide, and that democracy is being trampled in Hong Kong. Secretary of Defense Austin testified that he's focused on the pacing threat posed by the PRC, and he promised strong support for Taiwan. The commander of Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Phil Davidson, recently testified before Congress that the PRC could invade Taiwan in six years. Former Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Pottinger recently endorsed the Biden administration's approach to the PRC outlined in the interim guidance. I wonder if they'll all be declared persona non grata by Beijing. To protect the maritime domain, the U.S. will continue to cooperate with Indo-Pacific partners as we've always done to maintain freedom of navigation and other lawful uses of the sea so that all nations can benefit from the maritime commons. In this time of COVID, there is a concern that the PRC is seeking to take advantage of the region's focus on fighting the pandemic to coerce its neighbors and press its provocative claims in the South China Sea, as well as bully Taiwan. There are also concerns that the PRC will exploit nations in need of assistance by dangling medical aid in exchange for support of PRC talking points. We all must remain vigilant. So since the end of World War II, the network of US alliances and partnerships has been at the core of a stable and peaceful Indo-Pacific region. As I said at the beginning, relationships matter and alliances matter. No country can shape the future of the region in isolation and no vision for the region is complete without a robust network of sovereign countries cooperating to ensure their collective interests. So let me highlight at the end here, the importance of trilateral cooperation between the United States, the ROK and Japan. It's crucial for our three nations to work together to enhance our security cooperation and preserve their international rules-based order. Notwithstanding the current tensions between Seoul and Tokyo, the reality is that no important security or economic issue in the region can be addressed without both the ROKs and Japan's active involvement. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me finish by saying that I was given an amazing chance to be the ambassador to Korea. Though some of my former colleagues may beg to differ, I believe that there's no better place to serve as the US ambassador and no better partner or strategic ally for the United States than the Republic of Korea. So thank you again for this opportunity to address you. Thank you again for this amazing award. Uh, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ambassador Harris, for sharing your thinking and thoughts with us in that keynote. Ambassador Harris will now take questions from the audience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And I'll go ahead and get us started. You spoke about the importance of a relationship of relationships in both a personal level and on a national level. I wanna talk a little bit more about the latter. How do American alliances with South Korea, Japan and other Indo-Pacific states shape the United States' relationship with China and affect China's ability to potentially seek regional hegemony in Asia? Well, it's, it's a, it's a terrific question in the, in the heart of this symposium, I, I believe. Uh, so the United States uh, uh, places great value in alliances. Uh, we know that we can't do it alone, whatever the it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I said in my remarks, relationships matter and alliances matter uh, also. Uh, I'm pleased that the, that the new administration's interim security guidance uh, underscores this. China is, the PRC is uh, the challenge uh, of the age. It's the challenge that all of the current EPIC students uh, and all of the students at Fletcher will, will deal with uh, for the better part of their careers, uh, starting from this point forward. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, it's essential for the United States uh, to have uh, allies in the region uh, to be able to uh, 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 confront China where necessary, 
uh, and to work with China where we can. Uh, that, it's important. Uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, Evo Dalder from uh, uh, Chicago, former U.S. ambassador uh, uh, to NATO, said it rightly recently when he said that the United States has 55 allies uh, globally uh, and uh, uh, China has one, right, the DPRK and vice versa. So alliances matter. Uh, and I think uh, uh, a strong uh, unified position uh, uh, to confront China and to demonstrate to China that, that uh, we're watching, that we're going to hold them accountable uh, for their egregious human rights violations uh, and uh, their uh, um, industrial and uh, economic espionage and all the other things that they do, uh, I think is important. Absolutely. So going off of that, do you feel like China poses the largest threat to the U.S. Secure national security today? And if not, who do you think does? What state? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll stick with what I said when I was the PACOM commander. And, that's the, and that is that the greatest threat that we face today, I mean, this very, this very moment, uh, is from North Korea. Uh, but China is clearly the biggest challenge that we face, uh, grandly speaking, uh, for the foreseeable future. Mm. And our next question is from a student in Epic, Elliot. Given your experience working in the Pacific, how can the United States better position itself in regards to the actions that China is taking in the South China Sea? Well, I, I think that, uh, uh, the recognition that alliances matter is, is the, the most important thing. Uh, and I think that uh, what the President Biden and his team uh, have said that, uh, uh, you know, alliances aren't luxuries, they're essentials, uh, is, a, is a fundamental uh, way forward here. Uh, in the South China Sea specifically, uh, I think we have to continue to exert uh, uh, our right uh, and the rights of all nations uh, to sail the South China Sea uh, uh, and recognize that it is not China's South Sea, it is the South China Sea, that it is international water uh, and uh, that freedom of, freedom of navigation there matters. Uh, and uh, you, you uh, uh, guarantee freedom of navigation by exercising it, and you lose it ultimately uh, in the in the court of international law by not exercising it, and so it's important that uh, that uh, that nations join the United States uh, in uh, exercising freedom of navigation uh, and to uh, fly or sail uh, wherever international law allows, and international law allows us uh, the freedom of maneuver in the South China Sea. You know, the, the recent, uh, recent 2016 now, uh, five years ago almost, the uh, 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 International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the ITLAS Tribunal, which is a part of the, uh, the UNCLOS, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, of which the United States is not a signatory, but which we follow, uh, the ITLAS Tribunal ruled that the nine-dash line was illegal. And the nine-dash line essentially encompasses the, the totality of the South China Sea, essentially. Uh, and so uh, the, the Illawas Tribunal, uh, 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 you know, ruled that that was invalid. China is a signatory to the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. So uh, it's, it, it should abide by the rules uh, of the uh, organizations to which it's a member. The United States is not a member, yet we do abide by those rules. So that's the, that's the difference, I believe. Uh, between our approach uh, and uh, the PRC's approach. Yeah, absolutely. And to continue this discussion on the South China Sea, we have a question from Professor Weitz, who's the Director of Maritime Studies at the Fletcher School. Uh, Professor Weitz asks, what are your thoughts on the pros and cons of a much larger U.S. Coast Guard presence within the South China and East China Sea with offshore patrol clusters cutters and national security cutters to help our partners in the Indo-Pacific combat an illegal fishing and Coast Guard rivalry with the China's Coast Guard. 
Yeah, so I, I'm a, a naturally, uh, probably naturally, given my background, I'm a natural, naturally, I'm a proponent of, of uh, uh, greater uh, U.S. Navy and U.S. Coast Guard uh, uh, operations and presence uh, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea and, and, uh, and, and, and in the Western Pacific in general. Uh, the importance of the, of the Coast Guard presence out there, which we have not seen much in the last several years, uh, is that uh, the Coast Guards uh, of the world uh, operate uh, in, in a different space, if you will, legal space uh, than the navies uh, in the world. And the Coast Guard can do things that the U.S. Coast Guard can do things that the U.S. Navy cannot. So it's helpful that, that the Coast Guard is out there. Uh, and it's helpful uh, that the U.S. Coast Guard can, can uh, uh, be a, a counter uh, to the CCG, the China Coast Guard. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a, 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 a big proponent of it, and, and I'm pleased to see that the Coast Guard is, is, uh, uh, is operating now uh, with greater fluency, greater frequency rather, uh, in the Western Pacific. Hmm. I wanna transition the discussion a little because we have a couple questions coming in about the United States. So one question from Arjun, who's an EPIC student, does the fast paced change of administrations in the United States affect the continuity of diplomatic relationships in the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, I think it's, it's easy to, to, to say that, you know, uh, uh, the fast paced change affects our relationship, but, but the reality is that uh, it's not that really, it's not that fast paced, right? I mean, we've had eight years of the, or four years of the previous administration eight years of the one before that, uh, and, and on and on for, for our whole uh, uh, existence uh, as a country. So I, I think that, that, that uh, uh, the, uh, our partners and others uh, in the world recognize that the United States uh, uh, outlook is gonna shift with the change in administrations. What has generally not happened uh, is a change in foreign policy, uh, uh, the, 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 the fundamentals of, of American foreign policy and American defense policy with the change in administrations. You know, that old saw that, that uh, foreign policy uh, stops at the shoreline, uh, that domestic politics uh, only goes to the shoreline and then, then uh, it's, it's bipartisan. We, we've seen a more, in my opinion, we've seen a more uh, partisan, not bipartisan, but a more partisan foreign policy uh, shifts uh, in the last uh, uh, change in administrations, several changes in administration, not just in the Trump administration, but before that even. Uh, but I think that fundamentally, uh, the, the notion that alliances matter uh, and that uh, our relationships with countries matter, uh, I think that we, we have, uh, uh, return to that view, if you will, uh, which is a, in my opinion, a fundamentally bipartisan view uh, of U.S. foreign policy. So I'm encouraged by it. Uh, I, you know, I was in in Seoul uh, th uh, through the election, of course, and and the, and the two years before that, and for sure uh, there was there was there was you know uh, the, the Koreans were were you know swinging their heads, wondering what was next and. Uh, and, and all of that. But I think that this outreach by Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin, uh, I think that outreach uh, has demonstrated that uh, we have returned to a, uh, a collegial foreign policy where we rely on, we trust, we uh, uh, depend on our allies and that we can be dependent on uh, in uh, in reverse, so uh, I'm 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 happy to see where we are. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really valuable insight on the longstanding uh, importance of uh, allyships. One question from one of our TLIP students from Greece, Giannis: Do you believe that South Korea is unwilling to align with the U.S.'s current approach towards China in efforts to maintain a more positive relationship with with Beijing? Yeah. Um... I don't know if unwilling is, is the right word, but, but uh, uh, South Korea is, is, is 
clearly in a hard place. Uh, you know, they have characterized it as a shrimp among whales. Uh, I think that's an overcharacterization, oversimplification, really. Um, what, I, what I reminded my uh, Korean colleagues uh, was when I was there, I reminded them that, that we're not asking Korea to make a choice today. Uh, the United States made a choice, right? We made a choice in 1950 when we uh, uh, decided to defend South Korea uh, against communist aggression. South Korea made a choice in 1953 when it joined, formally joined an alliance with the U.S. Uh, the PRC also made a choice in 1950. Uh, and the DPRK, North Korea, made its choice uh, in the early 60s, 1961. So choices have been made. So let's not talk about choices. Uh, that said, uh, you know, uh, China is um, South Korea's number one trading partner, and they are a trading nation. Uh, uh, and so, you know, uh, they have to maintain this important relationship with China for their economy. Uh, and we are their number one security partner. In fact, we're their only security ally. Uh, but it's a false choice. When, 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 uh, when, when they are faced with choosing e economics on the one hand and security on the other. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but they are, they are cautious. There's no, no doubt about it. They are very careful uh, in uh, criticizing China uh, and, uh, and the like uh, because of that relationship and because of China's uh, ability to influence to some degree uh, North Korea. Mm -hmm. So on that note of North Korea, we have a couple of questions coming in about um, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and North Korea's relationship with nuclear weapons. Uh, one question from Frankie, an EPIC student, what is China's role in the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula? Yeah, so China plays a key role, right? I mean, uh, uh, I'm a believer in, in sanctions and in strong sanctions uh, against uh, North Korea. Uh, and uh, the sanctions that were in place, uh, brutal sanctions, uh, harsh sanctions, I think contributed significantly to bringing North Korea, Kim Jong-un to the negotiating table uh, in Singapore in 2018. So sanctions are important. Uh, those sanctions are United Nations sanctions, right? They're not American sanctions. They're not South Korean sanctions. They are United Nations sanctions. Uh, and we wouldn't have them without uh, China, without the PRC, because they get a veto uh, in, the, in the Security Council. Uh, and so uh, the PRC plays an important role uh, in, uh, 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 in the DPRK and, and the way forward with North-South relationships with uh, the outcomes of the Singapore summit, the relationship between uh, uh, Pyongyang and Washington. Uh, and so, you know, that in, in, in many respects, that's one of those areas that I spoke about in my remarks, where we partner well with China. Uh, though, again, there are those other areas, uh, which I won't belabor again, where we don't partner well with China. Mm. So going off of that, from your vantage point of South Korea and the Pacific Command, do you think nuclearization of the region is likely to increase, decrease, or stay the same over the next decade? Well, I mean, that's the hard work of diplomacy, right? So that it doesn't, so that uh, the area, the region, uh, and the world really uh, doesn't uh, proliferate. Uh, so so that's, that's important. Uh, I will say that... Uh, uh, that even though Singapore, which is one of those issues that I hinted at, uh, that, that uh, it was far from a perfect agreement, uh, that denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, that phrase uh, is, is sort of electric now, and it's, and it's in play again, just in remarks, uh, just coming out of uh, Korea uh, from the, uh, you know, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense's visit, uh, and the foreign ministry of South Korea's uh, comments, right? So is it denuclearization of uh, North Korea or is it denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula? The words matter. And that's one of the things that uh, Jim Stavridis taught me, words matter, words are important. Uh, so uh, we have denuclearized uh, South Korea uh, and we are after the denuclearization of North Korea. There are those who believe, and I'm in that camp, that the phrase denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula 
uh, is dangerous because it uh, hints at uh, breaking up the U.S. ROK alliance because even though we don't have nuclear weapons on the peninsula, we offer, you know, we, we provide a, a, a nuclear deterrent, strategic deterrent, a nuclear umbrella, if you will, uh, for our allies out there. And so, uh, you, you know, if you're going to, you can take the quote unquote denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula to, to you can extrapolate uh, the strategic deterrent that we afford our allies uh, as part of that. And, and that would be a, a mistake in my view. So we are after the denuclearization of North Korea. Let's not quibble about it. Let's not, you know, make uh, 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 get into semantics. That's what we're after. Uh, and if North Korea agrees to denuclearize and does, if they denuclearize, there is a bright future ahead of them uh, uh, and their people uh, if they agree to denuclearize. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, see what questions uh, 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 ensue from that. All right, well, we'll maybe come back to that conversation as more questions come up about it. A question from Ambassador John Hennessy Neeland, um, who'd like to ask a question about a particular type of ship, a partnership, an advantage that the US enjoys with its networks of friends and partners in the Indo-Pacific. Could you provide your perspective regarding the importance of our relationship with small but strategic partners, such as Paula and the other island nations? Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we have a, a 30 year uh, senior uh, veteran of the Foreign Service as the ambassador to Palau uh, is, uh, uh, speaks to the importance that we place uh, on those uh, little nations. You know, I reminded my, my friends and colleagues around the world that uh, the world's smallest nation, Nauru, gets the same vote in the General Assembly as the world's largest nation. Right, so nations, small nations matter. Uh, and uh, when you consider uh, the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and this idea of an EEZ, uh, exclusive economic zone, uh, you know, 200 miles uh, offshore, uh, that makes these little dots of countries big players. Uh, in the world and uh, search for food and search for resources and the like. You know, I, I used to have a chart when I was uh, in Hawaii as a PACOM commander that, that I used to throw up there that the world's sixth largest country, the sixth largest country in the world is France. And it's France because of French Polynesia and the millions of square miles of ocean, ocean floor around French Polynesia New Caledonia uh, and uh, 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 all of all of the, the the exclusive economic zone around that, and other territories uh, that France has ha uh, around the world have around the world. So uh, EEZs matter. EEZs matter greatly. You know we're seeing this play out in the South China Sea. This is really about the EEZs and the and the. Uh, the food stocks uh, in the South China Sea, and then their mineral deposits, uh, petroleum deposits, and all of that uh, that are extant uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, you know, this is this is on the one hand, it's about the, you know some uh, uh, historical issue dating back thousands of years, but in the reality, it's about resources. So uh, I would say to Ambassador Hennessy Nyland and and others that the U.S. Uh, values. Uh, these uh, 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 South Pacific countries, small countries. Uh, and if we don't, we should. Uh, and I'm hopeful that the new team uh, will embrace the importance uh, of uh, the, our compact countries and, 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 uh, and uh, others in the region. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting answer. Thank you for uh, expressing the importance of those relationships. Um, moving on to sort of more theoretical questions. Do you think we will see a rejection of the Western liberal world order by China in favor of an Asian Pacific dominated order independent of, of American support? 
Well, I, I don't. I don't think it's theoretical. Um, I think it's playing out now. I don't think it's a question of will we see China's rejection. I think we are seeing China's rejection. Uh, I think that this idea uh, that China is putting forth Asia for Asians and that kind of stuff, uh, you know, that that uh, that really smacks of a, of an earlier time. Uh, you know, the uh, and that. Uh, uh, you know the idea that China is the is a central kingdom, the center of the world, and everything emanates from Beijing. You know this is not theoretical fantasy. It's it's happening today uh, in in the uh, in the in the views that are put out uh, uh, from Beijing. So I, I think it, it's a, it's incumbent on on all of us to remain vigilant. I say us. You know I'm done. I'm retired. It's incumbent on all of you all to remain vigilant. Uh, to China's activities, not only uh, in the Indo-Pacific, but globally. You know, Admiral Fowler, who is the commander of U.S. Southern Command, uh, you know, based in Miami, responsible for, for, for U.S. operations in Central and South America, uh, you know, he, sp he testified recently about China's growing influence uh, in Latin America, uh, and he's concerned about that. And so, you know, we see China uh, operating globally, uh, just as we operate globally. Right, I mean, it's and so it, it requires vigilance and important, and it's important that that we call out China. Excuse me, we call out China when China does things that that are counter to internationally accepted norms and standards. So, going off of that, and with this global perspective, a question from a TLIP student from Kenya: How can Kenya and the rest of Africa best navigate the contestation of its economic space by both? The United States and by China. Well, you know, I, I would just say, uh, you know, I'm, no, I'm certainly no expert on it, on Kenya, uh, but I, I would say that 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 uh, uh, African countries, just like uh, countries in in South America and, and elsewhere, just have to be careful when you enter into large scale infrastructure development projects uh, with uh, the PRC. Uh, the PRC does not have your best interests at heart. The PRC has only its interests at heart. Uh, I think you can see throughout uh, Africa uh, the 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 uh, exoskeletons of of uh, projects that China has has uh, has undertaken and abandoned. You know, you can look at uh, Sri Lanka and the Hamman Toto port uh, and the outcomes. Uh, of entering into uh, 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 large-scale infrastructure um, uh, projects with China. You know, I talked about, I briefly mentioned debt diplomacy. I mean, that, that, is, that is weaponizing debt uh, in order to, to further uh, China's uh, global aims. Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of going back to your answer two questions ago about the importance of being diligent with our relationship towards China. Atre, an EPIC student, wants to know what tangible threats does China have that warrant the greater pivot towards Asia than what the U.S. national security apparatus already spends in that region? And do you think that threat is ideological, the threat of the CCP model of governance, or the fear of economic dominance? And can either of these threats actually be mitigated through an increased military presence? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, I mean, that, that's really a, compl a complex question. I, I think that, uh, again, it's not theoretical. Uh, China is, is on the move. Uh, and it's not a case of, of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, uh, another, just another country that's just, just trying to follow Adam Smith's uh, principles of enlightened self-interest, right? I mean, all countries should follow their, their enlightened, should, should operate and act in accordance with their enlightened self-interest. But China is doing so in ways that are uh, contrary to international rules-based order. I mean, we think that, that many of us think, uh, uh, Secretary Blinken agreed, uh, that what China is doing uh, in Western China in uh, Xinjiang province uh, is genocide, right? Against its, its, against its own people, the Uyghurs. Uh, what they've done in Hong Kong, what they've done in, 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 in other places. 
uh, th these, this is how China moves forward and uh, creates this, this, uh, this uh, unitary view of what China is. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. And then they're putting their money where their mouth is uh, in increasing their military capability and all that. And there's nothing wrong with having a strong military. The United States has a strong military, China does, Japan does, South Korea does, many other, Australia especially does, UK. I mean, many countries have strong militaries. But it's what you do with those militaries uh, and, and uh, uh, how you treat your, your neighbors, uh, 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 how you threaten your neighbors uh, is, is where uh, the vigilance is required and, uh, and, and a vigilant, and a, a, a being vigilant uh, is important. Mm -hmm. And going off of the conversation um, about Uyghur Muslims, Alex, an EPIC student mentioned, wants to know, given that you mentioned the importance of US ROK Japan alliances, how can these three actors work together to pressure the Chinese government to end the human rights abuses being committed against the Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region? Well, I, I think, uh, the, the, you know, uh, calling them out uh, is, is, is important. Uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't called them out uh, 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 beyond a few years ago when we started to do that, you know. So calling them out on the international stage uh, is important. Uh, China uh, is, uh, uh, considers it's, it's, it's how it's held uh, import, uh, with importance. So I, I think calling them out is, is, a, is a fundamental thing. Uh, getting nations to join in condemning China's actions are important. And this is where uh, South Korea, to, to get back to a, an earlier question, would not join uh, us in condemning uh, China's actions uh, in Western China, Muslim Western China. So that's important to, to get nations to, 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 to join in uh, calling, first calling out China and then condemning China for their actions. So you just speak of the importance of diplomacy. You have experience in both the military and in diplomatic realms. What is your philosophy and the balance of using hard power versus soft power, especially in regards to the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the Jim Mattis camp, right? Former uh, Secretary of Defense, when he said that uh, if you're going to cut the State Department's budget, then you better increase my budget for bullets and guns, right? Uh, and so you, uh, diplomacy uh, is uh, the first line of defense, uh, if you will. Um, you know, one of the things I learned uh, uh, throughout my military career, especially the, my latter military career, and especially in my time uh, after the military in, uh, 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 in, in Korea, uh, is that the U.S. military uh, has no monopoly on courage and dedication. Right. I mean, we, we have young men and women uh, running uh, provincial reconstruction teams in Afghanistan and, 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 and uh, out there in, in Iraq and uh, out there in, in many dangerous places in the world, essentially alone and afraid, right? I mean, uh, and, uh, and the military, when, when the military goes out, you know, you've got, you've got a battalion behind them, an air cover, you know, you got all this, all this stuff. So uh, the U.S. military has no monopoly on courage uh, or dedication when it comes to public service, especially when you're uh, talking about the State Department and, and young diplomats globally. So uh, I think it's important. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that diplomacy has to be the first line of defense. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, we're, we're talking about Dr. Mayer you know, France and Free France and all that. Way back, way back in the day, there was a fellow named Talleyrand, uh, uh, Maurice Talleyrand, a famous foreign minister in France. And he was saying one time to the head of the French army, uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, General, when, when my profession fails, yours has to take over. You know, that, that, that's, a, that, that's a flawed view, right? I mean, it shouldn't be when diplomacy fails and the military steps in. I think it's important and critical that the military uh, and, and diplomacy work hand in hand so that there doesn't have to come a time when one has to step in when the other fails. You know, we should be working together. That's why I was so excited, really thrilled 
to see the first overseas trip by the Biden administration be a joint trip. I mean, it's great that it was the Indo-Pacific, you know, I mean, that's fantastic. But the most important thing was the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense traveled together uh, to a region. Uh, and, you know, uh, good, good on them that uh, they, the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, Japan and Korea, first region. Uh, but they went together to, to show that solidarity between the soldier and the sailor on the one hand, airman, coast guardsman, Marina, I don't want to leave anybody out, uh, on the one hand, and the diplomat on the other. Thank you for sharing that. I think as students of international relations, we're often taught to think about those two things differently. So that's a really valuable insight to try to think about them together. Um, I want to transition the conversation because we've had a couple of questions come in about Taiwan. Carlos, an EPIC student, wants to know, does the United States stand by its position of defending Taiwan by any means necessary, as President Bush said? And do you believe that conflict over the island will escalate in the coming years? Yeah, so to the, to the first question, uh, you know, I, I don't want to uh, get technical or pedantic here, but we're governed by the Taiwan Relations Act, which is the law. And, and the law technically, you know, you need to get in the law. The law doesn't talk about defending Taiwan. The, the law talks about ensuring Taiwan has the means to defend itself. So there's, a, there's obligations in the Taiwan Relations Act. And one of those obligations involves, you know, foreign military sales, equipping Taiwan, helping Taiwan to be a better position to defend itself. So we work closely when I was at, uh, at the PACOM, now Indo-PACOM, uh, on uh, uh, helping Taiwan improve uh, its defensive capabilities. So our obligation is governed by the law and the law is very specific. And that's in the Taiwan Relations Act. I wanted to see, I advocated for uh, routinizing, is that a word, I'm not sure, but routinizing foreign military sales to Taiwan. So that we wouldn't have this, this spike and all the, all the political drama associated with a spike in foreign military sales, and then go for a few more years and have another big foreign military sales. You know, we should have a steady state uh, stream of, of uh, equipment uh, that goes to Taiwan. We should also uh, advocate for Taiwan uh, globally, uh, and we should call out China, and we have, uh, for trying to isolate Taiwan uh, in all its and uh, in, uh, in, in all the things that they've done. Uh, regarding whether uh, conflict is possible, uh, you know, you can go to CFR, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, uh, uh, doctors uh, Blackwell and Zalikow wrote recently wrote uh, an article where they talked about the imminent, imminent, not theoretical, but imminent risk of conflict between the US and the PRC over Taiwan. And then, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, 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 the man on the spot, uh, Admiral Phil Davidson, the Indo-Pacific Command Commander, he testified that he thought it was possible that the PRC would invade Taiwan within six years. So uh, when I was in Hawaii, I spoke about the 2020s as the decade of danger, right? I mean, if you, if you look at, at 2049 as a, as, a, as a benchmark, and that's the 100th anniversary of the founding of the, uh, uh, of the establishment, not the founding, the establishment of the People's Republic of China, the PRC, and then, uh, and then if you think about uh, Tiananmen uh, and the Beijing Olympics, right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm tying a bunch of things. I'm, I'm throwing out a bunch of ideas I'm going to tie together here. So if you look at, at Tiananmen Square and then, then the next milestone event that I'm talking about is Beijing Olympics. It took, it took what, a decade or around a decade for the, for the world to, to, to kind of forget about Tiananmen and embrace Beijing and the Olympics, right? I mean, it was, it was a giant celebration. And so if you go to 2049 as the, as the benchmark that you want people to embrace China and the, the, the centennial of the PRC uh, and all of that, then, then if they do anything forceful uh, about all their issues, right? And all their issues are uh, the South China Sea, uh, the East China Sea, the Senkakus, 
uh, Taiwan, uh, Western China, uh, all that. If, you know, if it takes a, uh, the world a decade to forget that, so now you're talking 2030s is when they'll act. So, uh, or when, they, when the world will forget so that they can move into 2049. The 2020s, we are in the decade of danger, I, I think. So that's kind of a, uh, a little fantasy there, but, but I think that we're in this decade of danger. And so Admiral Davidson has narrowed it down even more, right? I mean, he's, you know, this is not a decade of theoretical decade. He has said within six years and Blackwell and Zelikow have said uh, imminent. They use, they use the imminent word. So I, I think that, that the likelihood of, uh, of uh, conflict is possible. So it is the hard work of diplomats to prevent that uh, from happening, and the hard work of the, of, the, of, the, of the U.S. military and their allies to present a strong face to the Chinese military uh, and to reach out and demonstrate that we are with Taiwan uh, and that we are ready to help Taiwan uh, to answer uh, your students' uh, question there. So continuing the conversation of increasing tensions and given your naval background, uh, Ben, an EPIC student, wants to know, what do you make of China building up its Navy and could it prove a challenge to the US's naval dominance in the Pacific since the end of World War II? Yeah, um, well, I, you know, I think it's, it's a right of all nations to, to, to have a stronger military uh, as they want and can afford, right? I mean, that's just, that's a natural, uh, 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 tendency and it's and it's nothing wrong with that. It's what you do in your military that, that matters and and that's where you know uh, conflict start and, and things like that. So the fact of a of a strong PRC Navy uh, of itself uh, is is uh, is fine, uh, but it, it's it's what that Navy represents and what they do with it and 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 it goes back to the to the all the things that we've been talking about. Which, which are a matter of concern. Today, uh, to be honest and, and, and not boastful, uh, there's, no con there's no contest between the capability uh, of the PRC Navy, the PLA, People's Liberation Army Navy, the PLAN, and the US Navy uh, in the Western Pacific. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot is made of the Chinese uh, aircraft carriers. They have two now, the CV-16 and the CV-17. Uh, they are uh, basic in their ability to launch aircraft uh, and uh, fuel those aircraft uh, to go on, on uh, combat missions. The U.S. Navy, uh, with our aircraft carriers, can launch 70 sorties at, a, you know, I mean, just 200 sorties a day if necessary, uh, uh, aerial refueling, the whole thing. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's no contest. Uh, and then there are those people who talk about you know, uh, carrier killing missiles. You know, to that I would say, uh, if if the carriers are so vulnerable, then why is China investing in building carriers, right? So, uh, you know, there is a recognition that, that the aircraft carrier is an important uh, 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 vehicle of uh, military power. Uh, but today, there's no there's no contest. That said, we have to continue to resource our military uh, and develop it uh, because China certainly is. You know, uh, we, are, we are constrained uh, and rightly so by law regulation and policy uh, and in our, in our military development, scientific developments. Um, China is not. And, and, you know, they're out there uh, trying to steal our technology as, as I, I hinted at in my remarks, alluded to in my remarks. So it's important that we continue to develop and resource our military because the PRC uh, certainly is regarding its military. So continuing this conversation around security um, and military development, Luke wants to know what future do you think the Quad Countries Security Group has? And do you think it will be a successful way of balancing Chinese power in, in Asia? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big believer uh, in the Quad. Uh, I first advocated for it in 2016 
at the Rizina Dialogue in India. I was the, one of the keynote speakers there for that. Uh, I think Jake Sullivan, the, uh, the National Security Advisor, uh, has it right when he says it's the foundation upon which to build uh, a substantial U.S. policy uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. So I, I think it's good. Uh, you know, regarding, uh, I'm, I was often asked, and, and uh, uh, I suppose we were getting at, at it uh, 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 circuitously now, uh, I'm often asked whether Korea should be in the quad or not. I, I don't know. I mean, that's up to Korea on the one hand, uh, but there's no owner of the quad. There's no, there's no gate guard or gatekeeper, if you will. Uh, you know, and I always throw out American football, right? I mean, the Big Ten has 14 teams and the Big 12 has 10 teams. So there's nothing that says a quad has to have four teams. So, you know, but, but there are uh, some essential parts of the quad, uh, uh, not parts, there are some essential uh, principles in the quad, uh, which, which, I, which I think are, are important. Uh, you know, the four leaders of the Quad, the four heads of government, uh, put out a joint statement a few uh, a, a week or so ago, which is almost uh, unprecedented, right? It may be unprecedented, where they talked about democratic nations dedicated to delivering results through practical cooperation. You know, the, the Quad uh, is clear on where the challenge lies. And that challenge, as we've discussed before, is the PRC. So are countries like the ROK, you know, we talked about that also, are they willing to join a grouping of countries that, that holds the PRC as the biggest challenge uh, and that the countries together are dedicated to practical cooperation? So, you know, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot there uh, but I, again, uh, to go back to the beginning of, of this question, my answer to this question, I'm a big believer in the quad. And I think it's vitally important now more than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in light of some things that have happened in the United States and what happened on Monday night, uh, we have a question. Do you believe that diplomatic tensions between the United States and China are at all causally linked with the rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans in recent weeks in the United States. I'm, I'm sorry, we, 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 Gwen, would you say that again about the hate crimes and, and what the, the link to the question? Yeah, absolutely. Do you believe that diplomatic tensions between the United States and China are at all causally linked with the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans in recent weeks in the United States? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm Asian American, so I'm, I'm, as you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm um, sensitive to, to the question and it's an important question. I don't know if, if the relationship between the U.S. and China per se is directly linked to the increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans in the United States. Uh, but, the, but the way you phrase the question, you know, I mean, it's certainly it's possible, right? I mean, certainly there, there, it's possible that there's a linkage. I, I think the, the bigger issue that, that is contributing to hate crimes against Asian Americans uh, is probably coronavirus and uh, the, the origins of the, of the coronavirus. Uh, if you believe that the coronavirus started in, in China, then, uh, then that, that is probably the, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, a bigger source of the, a bigger linkage, if you will, to, to hate crimes against Asian Americans writ large uh, in the United States. It's not the tensions between Washington and Beijing per se, uh, but it's, it's the idea that the coronavirus began in China and there was a cover up and all of that. That idea, I, I think, uh, uh, is, a, is a bigger linkage. I could be wrong, but that's, that's what it seems like to me in reading it. It's not, uh, it's not China per se, it's, it's the coronavirus in particular. Yeah, thank you for your comments on that. It's an important conversation um, and a serious one and a sensitive one. I wanna end on a little bit more of a hopeful note. We have a lot of good questions, but one last one, especially seeing that so much of the audience are young people and students. 
what do you see as the role that youth can play in easing the U.S.-China relationships going forward? Yeah, so I, I think the youth, uh, you know, that's the key, right? I mean, I mean, the youth of today will be the the old folks tomorrow, and and so it's 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 in that in in that span between today and tomorrow that everything is going to happen, right? I mean, the military is going to be uh, populated by young people today who are growing to old guys like me tomorrow. Uh, dipl diplomats will start out as students in EPIC and end up as ambassadors like uh, Ambassador uh, John Hennessy Allen uh, and the like. But the, the youth uh, is, is, the, uh, is critical, right? I mean, look at, just look at, uh, uh, at South Korea. I mean, look at uh, BTS. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a Korean phenomenon. It's BTS is a global phenomenon, right? I mean, look what happened when China had the audacity to, to, to claim that uh, kimchi was somehow originated uh, in China and, and, and what happened as, uh, from that, you know, and then look at the, 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 the actions of, uh, of the young people in Korea, look at uh, the cultural phenomenon that's the, the movie Parasite or the, or the current movie uh, uh, of note, uh, Minari, uh, and all that. So the youth play such a, a vital role. Uh, the key, though, I think, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, speaking from personal experience, you know, we lose that, right? So the key uh, is, to, is, to, uh, is to keep that uh, energy and vigor and enthusiasm and idealism uh, in, uh, that, 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 that uh, exemplifies young people to keep that going uh, as as you go from young to old, uh, and so uh, you know I, I'm excited uh, when I look at uh, at uh, students uh, at, at uh, Fletcher and uh, the Kennedy School and uh, uh, you know Georgetown and other places uh, and the idealism they have, and I just hope that they can maintain that that level of of uh, excitement uh, as they uh, grow old. That's a really valuable answer and certainly something for all of us to keep in mind. Some of us I know are freshmen 18, others about to graduate and others um, beyond that. Uh, that's all the time we have with Ambassador Harris today. Ambassador Harris, I wanna thank you for sharing your experiences and thinking, answering our questions. You certainly gave us a lot to think about as, as we start our weekend. Um, to our audience, please join us tomorrow morning for our first panel of the symposium on China, US, Russia, multipolarity or polar opposites. Information on the panel can be found in the chat right now. Ambassador Harris, thank you once again for being with us today and thank you all for joining us. And we hope thank to see you all. Tomorrow.